Then he'll sit down, we'll all talk about it around um, the thesis he wrote, uh, asking him questions about it. And the last 10 minutes of our time will be dedicated to your questions. So, you know, make note of things you'd like to ask him at the end. Um, please make your cell phones quiet. Um, and if possible, try not to come in and out during the time. Hello everyone, and welcome to my senior thesis defense. Thank you all for coming, and especially thank you to Ms. Cronwell for truly doing everything she could to guide me through writing this paper. Thank you. I was turning it off. Thank you to Mr. Ketcher for great discussions on Augustine, and Mrs. Weddington as well for being on my panel as an auxiliary reader. So, when I first started writing about what, thinking about what I wanted to write about, the first thing that came to mind was faith. Faith has always been interesting to me, and I have always struggled with religion and trying to figure out what I believed in. When I was in 10th grade, I would have scoffed at the idea of the good not being in the rational. Yes, I was one of those people. I probably would have pointed out the logical fallacies in the argument, which is completely missing the point of the argument, which is that logic is not what is most important. However, the books I read for this paper changed me. When I was asked for preceptorials for both Augustine, a Catholic saint, and Kierkegaard, the grandfather of existentialism, I knew I was in for a good time. <laughs> when I first started this process, I knew I wanted to connect morality and faith somehow, but I wasn't sure how yet. Throughout St. Augustine's Confessions, we see Augustine transform from a delinquent, thieving adolescent to a thriving Catholic saint. Throughout this journey, Augustine struggles with the irrationality of the Catholic faith, but in the end, a miracle in the Garden of Milan, in which he's at his lowest of lows, still a partier, still an adulterer, is what changes him. He picks up a Bible and opens to a random verse, and that verse just so happens to read, not in riots and drunken parties, not in eroticism and indecencies, not in strife and rivalry, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh and its lusts. After reading this verse, Augustine changes and becomes the saint we all know him as today. The second book I read was Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling. Kierkegaard explores the story of Abraham and Isaac in which Abraham is told by God to kill his only son, and Abraham does as he is told, only stopping with the knife above his son when God comes down and tells him it was all a test. Hmm. Last I checked, <laughs> attempting to sacrifice your son isn't something we would consider good, and yet Abraham is praised. However, Kierkegaard tells us this action was indeed good, because it was ordained by God. This is so illogical, but he may be on to something. Kierkegaard describes Abraham as something called a knight of faith, and I argue that Augustine was also a knight of faith. There are two motions in becoming a knight of faith. Firstly, one must acknowledge the impossibility of God, but secondly, one must accept him anyways. Both of these steps can be seen beautifully in Augustine's journey of faith. But at this point you might be wondering, what does this all have to do with the good and the rational? Well, using faith as an example, I showed that something irrational can indeed be good. Not only is faith irrational, but it is necessary to acknowledge its irrationality in order to truly have it. Its essence is its irrationality. And as for goodness, Kierkegaard offers us insight into that as well. We can see that he believes faith is a passion, something superior, despite believing it is paradoxical. One example of this goodness is Augustine once again. Augustine was a sensualist, and once he came to faith, he traded those sinful earthly pleasures for God. In addition to this, his mother waited 30 years for him to come to faith, and when he finally did, it made her a much happier person. Without faith, Augustine would have died a sexually frustrated, forgotten delinquent, and his mother would have died sad because her son never would have realized what he was doing wrong. I showed that this is one example of faith being used for the good, showing that the good is not always in the rational. However, it's not that simple. I also explored examples that would disagree with me. For example, I looked at Aquinas' proof of God's existence. Aquinas shows that humanity and the universe in general needed a first mover because nothing can move without being pushed by something else. He calls this first mover God. 
When I first read this, I thought, shoot, this seems like a very rational proof of God, and it totally ruins my argument. However, I realized it doesn't necessarily. The first mover doesn't have to be God. In fact, Nietzsche describes it as a will to power in his book Beyond Good and Evil. Now, at this point, I conceded that there probably had to be some kind of higher power, but I still could confidently say that this did not rationally prove the Christian God, nor any God, really. I also used Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil in a very different way as my third primary text. Nietzsche believed that faith was bad, and not only that it was bad, but that, and I quote, the Christian faith is from the beginning sacrifice. Sacrifice of all freedom, all pride, all self-confidence of spirit, at the same time enslavement and self-mockery, self-mutilation. Woo! This is quite a difference from what we had earlier. I could talk for hours about all the components of this claim, but I'll spare you. He thinks that faith is essentially evil. In its essence, faith is not only irrational, but also evil. While Nietzsche does make some solid-sounding claims, I showed that he is biased against faith by showing examples in which he did not exactly hit the mark. He reacts with anger at differing opinions, and he is a very emotional arguer. Through this, I showed that it was more Nietzsche's close-mindedness rather than actual evil that was guiding his ideas. So, in conclusion, through looking at every side of every claim, I realized that faith is both good and irrational. This realization blew my mind when I first came to it, because I realized that it means the good is not necessarily found in the, in the rational. For me, the implications of this are huge, because it means that I can go into discussions more open-minded to all ideas, more willing to listen. And I hope everyone can learn something from this as well. Mm -hmm.